Good morning, dear friends. Welcome everyone to AABN's 89th webinar. So to those of you visiting for the first time, welcome to AABN. We have a lot of brain powers here. We have got innovators and investors, business leaders, entrepreneurs, professionals, academicians. We are here today at AABN because we believe in the power of entrepreneurship. And this matters to us because encouraging the spirit of entrepreneurship can help us to tackle some of the greatest challenges that we face. Our guest speaker, Professor Krishnasamy Nandakumar, for today's session on perspectives on manufacturing innovation in chemical engineering will not only showcase his expertise, but also look at ways to improve business. Chemical companies that seek to survive the challenges ahead should rethink the traditional approaches to innovation. It could entail capitalizing on innovation by leveraging the advances in digital and material science technology, collaborating with ecosystem partners and focusing on business model equity. The primary drivers of sustainable growth in the chemical industry continue to be innovation. But chemical companies' age-old approach to innovation and the status quo might no longer be an option. This is because a staggering amount of changes occupied has occurred in the industry and there could be more to come. The answer lies in the rise of digital technologies and open digital platforms used as material informatics. Values migrating from the traditional R&D departments of chemical companies to material informatics platforms. Until now, the process of discovering and developing new chemicals has remained largely unchanged and primarily lab-based. There was often a disconnect between the accelerating pace of change in the marketplace and slowness of the innovation process. To meet the demand for increased sustainability, safety, and reliability, chemical process industries owners must change the way they maintain their assets. A digitalization can provide opportunities for efficiency gains. Chemical process industries need to master digital transformation to turn opportunities into reality, securing revenue and profit growth. This transformation starts with the ambition to become truly data-driven in the decision-making pro decision process. As such, the true Digital twin technology is becoming a game changer when operators got previously unrevealed insights on the current performance and condition of the assets. In today's webinar, Professor Krishnasamy Nandakumar will provide us with his first-hand insights for companies to successfully change their decision-making with digital twins. For today's webinar, we have one of the most inspiring self-made icons from the academic world. Dear friends, please join me in welcoming Professor Krishnakumar Nandakumar. Krishnasamy Nandakumar. I'm sorry. Dr. K. Nandakumar is currently Gordon A. and Mary Kane Chair Professor at Louisiana State University. Before this, he was the GASCO Chair Professor at the Petroleum Institute, Abu Dhabi. Formerly, he was the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering at the University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada for nearly 25 years. Dr. Nandakumar received his B.Tech from Madras University in 1973, his M.Sc. from the University of Sachs Chivan in 1975 and his PhD from Princeton University in 1979. He received the Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship from the German government in 1989-90 and the Albert, Albert Wright and Wilson American Award from the Canadian Society of Chemical Engineering in 1991 for distinguished contribution to chemical engineering before reaching the age of 40. Dr. Nanda Kumar was elected a fellow of the Chemical Institute of Canada in 1991 and a fellow of the Engineering Institute of Canada in 2006, and a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering in 2007. He has received from the University of Alberta the McCullough Professorship 1992, the Kilam Annual Professorship 20, 2001 for Excellence in Research, and the Rutherford Award 2001 for Excellence in Teaching. He has also received the Excellence in Education Award 2002 from APEWGA, the Professional Engineering Association in Alberta. He was Editor-in-Chief of the Canadian Journal of Chemical Engineering from 2005 to 2009. Dr. Nandakumar is also the recipient of the Premier Award of the Canadian Society for Chemical Engineering called the RSJ Memorial Award in 2008. At LSU, he has received the 2021 LSU Alumni Association Faculty Excellence Award. At present, he is the visiting fellow at TIFR under the Vajra Fellowship of SCIRB Government of India. All these achievements and the laurels bestowed upon him over the past four plus decades sits rather lightly on a self-effacing shoulders. I believe that we are participating in this webinar. We are in the right place and the right time. Together, let us accelerate the exchange of ideas 
and scaling up of good practices. I'm confident that you'll find new ideas, fresh energy, and novel partnerships to sustain your efforts in support of our entrepreneurs and recovery from COVID-19. I also wish to place on record a deep commitment to work tirelessly as a team to carry forward our goals in a constructive, gratifying way. I wish you all a very successful webinar. Thank you, and over to you, Mr. Nandakumar. Thank you, uh, Gopi, for this opportunity and for uh, putting this talk in perspective. I have never seen an introduction as beautiful and as focused because it resonates directly with uh, the message that uh, I'm going to share with you. And I also want to thank Murthy for uh, enabling uh, this opportunity and uh, record my deepest uh, respect and uh, acknowledgement for the education that I received from RECT, uh, all the faculty there. Uh, in particular, one person I am truly indebted to uh, is Professor Vaidyanathan, uh, who shepherded me in the right direction. Uh, he just uh, joined uh, RECT uh, when we were in the fourth year, I believe. And uh, I remember his dedication, uh, even though we didn't have computers at the time, uh, in the curriculum or on campus anywhere, uh, he offered to teach us computer programming voluntarily uh, in the evening hours. And a few of us will go and listen to him. He taught us an introduction to Fortran. But of course, we didn't have any computer to practice anything. We hadn't even seen a punched card until I left RECT and went and joined the uh, University of Saskatchewan. My first project was on computational fluid dynamics. So I had to learn. So this, uh, he laid the foundation for me and uh, also advised me on how to develop my career. I'm really very thankful to you, uh, Professor Vaidyanathan. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is uh, a, a kind of a very, very broad stroke perspective on uh, what innovation is and what is manufacturing innovation in chemical engineering look like at present. So as chemical engineers, we capture the material and energy that I have indicated on the lower left part, whether it is biomass, whether it is minerals or petroleum and energy sources. And we convert them in a sustainable way to useful products through a set of uh, technologies, the chemical plant, the conversion technologies. Chemical engineers basically are glorified cooks. They do mix and separate and react all the things that a, a cook is familiar with in the kitchen, but on a very massive scale. And what are the opportunities for innovation in that is what I'm going to focus on. This is uh, based on an article that we wrote recently uh, called Perspectives on Manufacturing Innovation in American Chemical Society's Engineering AU, a new journal. I uh, collaborated with Professor Joshi from Mumbai with whom I'm working at present in Mumbai and then two, uh, two of my other colleagues, Professor Valsaraj and Professor Nigam from IIT Delhi. And uh, the left figure that you see appearing is the front cover of that journal. This was a picture drawn by my daughter when she was in eighth grade. Now, of course, she's uh, grown up, but the picture was very appropriate for this journal because it talks about or illustrates how chemicals led to biology, led to life, and how life is made sustainable by solar energy, et cetera. A lot of ideas that were captured when she was so young it seemed to resonate with the idea that we're talking about at this. Uh, I will also take some ideas, and uh, as I said, it's a broad stroke on innovation, trying to understand innovation and look for opportunities for innovation in chemical manufacturing. So many of you might have read this book. It's a fairly old book now, about 20 years old uh, by Kurzweil. Uh, he's uh, at Google at present, but he was at MIT and uh, author of a book called Singularity is Near. And it brings together the perspectives on the growth rate, how things are changing very rapidly. So I will draw some material from his work as well. Now, the picture that you see right now appearing is a Mississippi in the US. And I live in Baton Rouge, and there are over 300 chemical plants along the river, polluting the river. Um, and uh, the, it's a fine ecosystem for chemical manufacturing but it is 40 years old. So what can we do to improve and 
make it sustainable and environmentally friendly, et cetera. These are the issues that are driving chemical engineering research at uh, LSU. So I'm going to give my talk in three parts and I will address the questions that I shared with Gopi. What is innovation, the role of computers in society in general and in engineering design? And uh, a little bit about the history of innovation in chemical engineering. How did chemical engineering evolve and became so efficient in apply, being applicable to a broad range of industries? And then I will talk about the scales from molecules to the plant. How do chemical engineers engineer molecules to come together and react and produce a particular product or pull the molecules apart. So what do we need to understand from the molecular level all the way to the plant level if we want to do a digital twin of the entire process? If this is truly a multi-scale, uh, multi-phase, multi-physics uh, modeling process. So I will talk in general, I won't bore you with equations and stuff that go into the simulators, but I will talk in general conceptually about the process design uh, opportunities for innovation. And I will conclude it with one example of a polyethylene loop reactor, a retrofit that, that we suggested using the advanced models to improve the productivity. And one nature inspired design, an original design that was done in silico on the computer before it was fabricated, a distributor to replace the coke glitch distributors that are currently used in packed columns and conclude with a few uh, remarks. Now, uh, this is a concept I think originally I heard from the CTO of Dow Chemicals to understand the difference between invention and innovation. Invention is something that you create that doesn't exist before, and innovation is achieved by through uh, sustained incremental improvement every year, 2% here, 3% there to improve the fuel efficiency, to reduce the drag, etc. And in the automotive industry, you see from a Model T 100 years ago to a Model Porsche, enormous gains in the power, in the capacity, in the performance, et cetera, that is achieved through innovation in automotive industry. If you look at the aerospace industry, Wright Brothers planes on the left, and then the modern Dreamliner Boeing plane on the right. The Boeing can carry about 400 people, 800 people perhaps, at enormous speeds and over enormous distances, but Wright Brothers enabled it by inventing an initial plane. I'm not sure how many of you will recognize the last picture here. This is a room full of diode-based computers called ENIAC. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see, I'm sure all of you have a phone in your hand and probably browsing through it right now. And that phone is the million times smaller than the room full of computers and a million times faster. This has achieved in just the 40, 50 years or so. Phenomenal improvement achieved through incremental improvement year after year and a rapid innovation cycle and uh, using advanced um, tools for innovation. And if you ask the question, what is the situation in chemical process? You see a plant in 1940 and a plant 2016. Uh, they are distillation columns. They look very similar. Some of them may look more cleaner than before, but if you look at the internals, they are essentially the same. So we will address the question of what is the status in chemical industry and what are the opportunities for innovation. New chemicals are being discovered or synthesized at an extremely rapid rate, but manufacturing technologies are slow to evolve and we need to understand why that is so that we can remove the bottleneck. That's what this talk is going to be. Um, this graph was, uh, I first saw it from the president of American Institute of Chemical Engineers uh, several years ago when he gave a talk. It plots on the x-axis the percentage of population employed in agriculture, and on the y-axis the percentage of population employed in manufacturing over a period of say 2000 years. So the time starts on the rightmost bottom part. So at one time, then 98% of the population was engaged in producing the food that they needed. But as revolutions and in innovations occurred in uh, agriculture and uh, industrialization took place, right now only 2% of the entire population produces the food necessary for all the 6 billion people. It's a phenomenal improvement in agricultural efficiency. And the people that were left 
off from the agricultural field went on to build industry. So they were absorbed by manufacturing sectors in all areas, whether it is automotive or uh, electronics or whatever it is. But what you see is in the last 30, 40 years, that number being employed in manufacturing is going down. This is the data supporting that uh, from the, I think one of the economist uh, journal. And so what is happening is manufacturing is being automated away. So it's employing fewer and fewer people. Now, some people post this as a cause for alarm, oh, we're all going to be unemployed. That is not the case. When the 98% reduced to 2%, the rest were liberated to creatively think and come up with other innovations in the manufacturing sector. Currently, it's the uh, ICT, the Information and Computation Technology, Communication Technologies, that is absorbing more and more people into a new area. I think one of the talks in the series was about uh, destructive innovation uh, I, I listened to. So that is what is driving the technological improvement. And this is the uh, figure from Ray Kurzweil's book. It's a beautiful book. It talks about six epochs of uh, growth from millions of years ago. So he talks about initially at the birth of the universe, if you like, dominant places where information was stored was in the physics and chemistry, in the atomic structures, the nucleus, the electron structure that built the periodic table, the, the atoms and the molecules. Then the information got transferred into DNAs when biology became important. So from physics, chemistry to biology, where information was stored in a more structured way and a reproducible way in the DNA. Then the brains evolved. So the brains, the neural patterns started storing the information. Intelligence emerged uh, from, from those living organisms. Now information is being stored in hardware and software and computers and computers are becoming more and more powerful. And what he envisaged is uh, the machine and human intelligence will merge and we will come to understand the universe in a completely new way. And this is a graph from the same book where he talks on the y-axis, plots on the y-axis, the time to the next event from formation of life to the eukaryotic cells, to reptiles, to primates, et cetera. And on the x-axis, the time before the present time. So we are in the here, the present time. And you see industrial revolution is only a small blip in the last 400 years. It took millions and billions of years for life to evolve. And uh, industrial revolution started only 400 years. Computers started only 50, 60 years ago to becoming uh, predominant. And if you plot the same thing on the linear scale instead of a log log scale, the picture becomes like this. And that is what he means by singularity is here or near. That is an exponential growth. The growth for successive innovations to take place is occurring at shorter and shorter time scale. And uh, th that is the nature of innovation, building on the previous uh, achievements. And this is another graph from the same book. And there are some phenomenal predictions here. That's why I picked this one. So you can look at the data at your own uh, pace and I can make these slides available to you if you want. But one of the predictions is a computer will become as smart as a human brain power in 2023 next year, okay? And I will show you some evidence that this may actually be happening. And 2045, he predicts the computers will surpass in their uh, intelligence, the combined brain power of all the humans. That seems outrageous claim, but uh, uh, if not as many of us are holding this and some of you will see it in your lifetime, but it's certainly happening in the next 40, 50 years or so. It's a phenomenal prediction, but all the other predictions in the past have come true. So yeah. that you can so see these. Are there any questions or? Okay. If there are no questions, I feel free to interrupt me, but you need to unmute and ask. Uh, I'm not watching the uh, chat box because I want the screen space to be utilized well. Um, so this is a graph I picked from one of the TED Talks where it plots the productivity against time. And what you see here is a small increase in productivity around the time of the industrial revolution when we learn to overcome our muscle power. 
uh, that was the time when we were driving the mills with our foot, for example, how much weight we can carry, how fast we can run, etc. determined our extent of interaction with our neighboring population. With industrial revolution, we were able to build steam engines, planes, cars, mobility increased, and the power to build larger uh, capacity uh, industries improved. The next revolution is going to be to match our brain power. So humans have two limitations by our biology, the machine power, the physical strength, and the mental strength. And our mental strength is being augmented by machines already, machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, et cetera. That's an area I think India should invest very strongly because uh, other countries are really uh, making phenomenal progress. I will convince you of that. And this is a slide I took from a Google engineer to talk about machine intelligence and how it is used in engineering design. So think of y equals mx as a simple model. It's a very simple linear algebraic equation, but it illustrates the point very well. The point is that we can consider a relationship between these three variables, y, m, and x. These could be large vectors and m could be large matrix, et cetera. Or it could be much more complicated model when you're talking about physical and chemical systems. But what happens really is in the learning process or the training process, we have a huge amount of images, 100,000 mm -hmm. images, y is known. And we have a set of labels and x is known and we are training whether it is a child or whether it is an artificial machine, we are training what M is. We are mapping a picture with a label, and that is the training phase. It's same for human brains as a child to adult growth, or it's the same for a machine intelligence. The next, this is done with neural networks, and there are significant advances that are being made in neural networks and machine learning. The next stage is the relationship is inverted. Now that we have taught the child about lots of images, we can ask the child, what is this uh, uh, picture of? That is labeled this. So show the image and say, what is this a picture of? And the child knows M now, it has been trained. Its neural networks have been developed so it can answer that it is a flower. And this is the prediction problem. So the learning problem, the training problem, followed by the prediction problem. The third part is the creative part or the design problem. In the design problem, we say, okay, I will give you the label and draw me a picture. We do this with the ch children. We give them the crayon and say, draw me a bird. Can computers do that? Okay, now I'm asking what is Y having trained M and given a label X. And this is the picture 10 years ago that the Google computer produced of birds. Okay, this is a computer generated uh, image. And this is now in the last 10 years come a long, long way as I'm going to illustrate uh, next. Now, this is, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. I have given a link, you can go and play there. Uh, this is called the GPT-3 language model. This is uh, by an organization called OpenAI funded by Microsoft, Elon Musk and the others. And essentially what it does is you give it a prompt and it will write an essay on it, okay? When I gave this lecture at AIFR, I gave the prompt, Dr. Hermi Baba was, and then it completed an essay. So this is a language model. I'm not sure uh, where this is coming from, some <laughs> on the screen. Um, so the language model essentially wrote in this case, uh, uh, Kar Karanadi was a politician in Tamil Nadu is the prompt that I gave. Everything else the computer wrote. You can admire the language. It's perfectly well-trained to write in good English, uh, but it has some information. And it continues saying uh, in, the, uh, in Tamil Nadu state of India, he was born in 1925 in uh, Villapuram in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, blah, blah, blah. You can read that. How many of this is accurate? I don't know. There is a problem for us because these were trained with information coming from the Western culture. Okay, so it may not be as accurate as it is uh, for the Western information that you can solve. Well, I gave the same prompt one more time to see what it does. Karnanadi was, I just stopped there. It wrote a different story this time. It was the chief minister of Tamil Nadu in the 80s when a series of events, including the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi in 1991, precipitated the rise of DMK as a political force, etc. Again, you can question the accuracy because the accuracy is determined by what data is used to train the language model, the GPT language model. 
um, but it's uh, English language construction is very good and it is focused on Indian information. It's not focused on, it doesn't talk about Khrushchev or anybody else when I'm talking about Karnanidhi, for example, right? And uh, these are the various language models that have been developed in the last. And GPT-3 is the most advanced model and it stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. It uses 175 billion neurons in its neural network. In contrast, humans are estimated to have about 86 billion neurons. So these computers are becoming powerful. Remember the curse prediction in uh, 2023, the computers will become as powerful as the single human brain. In terms of neural counts, they are already exceeding that. And the information that they have digested in training this model is writes in petabytes of data. But they're all relevant to the Western uh, philosophy, Western civilization, etc. cetera. Um, this is... Uh, even more interesting by the same organization, OpenAI. And here, what they have done is they have trained it with billions of images, okay? And uh, this is called Dali. Uh, those of you that know painter, uh, Spanish painter Dali and uh, Wally the movie, this is uh, combined from the, those two uh, to create, create and give it a name. And what you do is you describe in words and you ask the computer to draw a picture. Okay, so again, you can go to this website and ask them, play with it. Here is a, a bowl of soup that is a portal to another dimension as a digital art. These are the keywords that were given. And this was the image that was created by a computer. Okay, a painting that was created by a computer, which is photorealistic. If you look at it, it's not a painting, it's a digital image created by a computer. Amazingly powerful. So we are almost there in terms of two of the creative aspects, writing and painting. Can it do with music? Can it do with uh, poetry? Th th there are every chance to expect that as long as we have the training data, we can use these machinery, the algorithms we have developed to create these things. Can we use this to do design of engineering systems is what I'm going to focus on. So I'm going to switch now to the second part of the story, chemical engineering. Okay, so in the, these are numbers from the US. There are about 70,000 chemical products being produced. There are about 10,000 companies. It's a huge industry, 769 billion turnover. Louisiana, where I come from, is 75 billion. It's a huge industry in Louisiana itself. One out of five patents are coming from this industry. This is changing rapidly, but still it's a dominant force. So a novel substance, a new molecule, is either isolated or synthesized every 2.6 seconds. That is, by the time I finished this sentence, a new molecule would have been created somewhere in the world. That's how fast innovation is taking place in making new chemicals or new molecules. And the chemical abstract service that documents all these molecules has 182 million known chemicals in their catalog. And this information is going to help future, uh, further in synthesizing even new chemicals, more important chemicals, et cetera. The pace of acceleration, you will see the next uh, statistic. It took 33 years to get the first 10 million chemicals registered, but it took only nine months to get the last 10 million chemicals registered into the database. Again, you see the pace of innovation, the pace of accumulating data, organizing data to make it useful. And uh, this essentially shows the reach of chemical industry across a broad spectrum of applications. And I think we are all familiar with that. And this tells you what are the most dominant chemicals that are produced in large amount. And ammonia in particular is an important chemical. And there are interesting innovation lessons that we can learn from that. But these also are the ones that consume the most amount of energy. So when <laughs> When we are talking about uh, when we are talking about uh, innovations, how did innovation take place? For example, in manufacturing ammonia in large quantities. When we wrote this article, we reached out to Professor M. M. Sharma, a leading chemical engineer in India, and uh, he has recorded for us early stories of innovation, and he particularly focuses on ammonia. It is available on the ACS site. If you are interested in listening to his lecture, the audio lecture is available online at the ACS site. And it's a very uh, interesting and uh, engaging talk. 
Now, if you look at the history of uh, how chemical engineering evolved, as I said, cooks are good chemical engineers and we have been making wine and leather and smelting ores, et cetera, for 2000 years. China, India have been, uh, had a flourishing economy for over 2000 years. And so chemical engineering has been kind of be present there, but it was in, 18, uh, in 1792 in Ecole Polytechnic, they started a formal training curriculum based on mathematics and science and for used for manufacturing explosives. And uh, I guess that was the rise of the West and the fall of China and India with the development of explosives. And uh, George Davis in 1887, that was a key event. He was an industrial engineer uh, inspector. So his job was to go in different uh, chemical companies and make sure that they are operated in a safe fashion. But the way that uh, these uh, plants were erected were by through apprenticeship training. If you are a sulfuric acid manufacturing expert, you know only about sulfuric acid manufacturing. You don't know anything about ammonia. You don't know anything about uh, uh, other manufacturing processes. Davis observed that all these different plants, even though they don't talk to each other, he saw that they were using the same kind of equipment. And so he said, there is some common things, and that was the birth of the unit operations as a synthesizing concept around early 1900. So chemical engineering is only about 100 years old. And uh, then a whole series of innovations occur and chemical engineering curriculum spread widely in US and in India very quickly. And in the 50s, a second level of synthesis took place when mathematics got into chemical engineering. And people realized that there is no difference in the mathematical equations describing uh, fluid mechanics or heat transfer or mass transfer. Bert Stewart and Lightfoot did that for us. And similarly, uh, an absorption column or a distillation column, when you write down the mass and energy balance equation, they look the same. They can be solved using the same solvers. That led to the Aspen as a simulator. Every plant in India, for example, today would use a process simulator like this for plant-wide management. In 2000, a third revolution started, which is the biochemical and biomolecular engineering. This is when chemical engineers realized human body is a perfect chemical machine. And I will talk a little bit about it later on, but that's a new evolution that is taking place in chemical engineering. So a little bit about uh, the Haber-Bosch uh, process. Uh, this is the process for converting uh, nitrogen and hydrogen into ammonia. And this was discovered by uh, two chemists and industrial engineer, Haber and Bosch. This is the size of the chemical plant, the first plant in 1913. It was designed by, uh, uh, enabled by these two chemists and uh, engineer. And they tried 5,000 different catalysts at different temperatures and pressures. That was the process of innovation at the time, just trial and error test and see whether it works or not. There is no theoretical understanding of why this condition should lead to better uh, yield or better conversion, et cetera. It was in 2007 that we understood the surface chemistry of catalysis to be able to manufacture these things, a uh, catalyst in a, in a better fashion. All three won Nobel Prize. But why is that? The first, of course, is by observation, brute force experimentation. The second comes from theoretical understanding uh, in, uh, in quantum mechanics, et cetera. And they proved Malthus wrong. Because Malthus theory was that the population grows exponentially, the food supply grows in an arithmetic fashion. So there is no way we can feed the entire population. With the manufacturing of ammonia in large quantities, a lot of other things became possible, fertilizers and stuff like that. So technology, I'm an optimist with respect to technology. It always solves problems from the past. It creates problems for the future. So we need to be aware of what problems it creates uh, in a proactive manner to achieve sustainability. This is a modern plant in, uh, in Germany, uh, BASF. And the plants that they use, distillation columns, et cetera, have a very complicated internal structure of uh, mixing and separation. And uh, this is a slide that just shows the evolution away from energy and automotives to tech. The 10 largest companies in 1980s, eight of them, six of them were energy and two of them were automotive. And IBM and General Electric were the odd things out. 
but in 2020, seven of them are tech companies in terms of market cap, and three of them are investment companies. So is energy become irrelevant? I don't think so. Energy is the one that fuels our uh, existence. Um, so how do we adopt these technologies to make energy utilization efficient and sustainable? Uh, this is a typical tray in a distillation column. These are the sieves and the liquid comes down from the downcomer, flows across, overflow. And there is significant mixing of liquid and vapor and separation, disengagement, to transfer selective species one from phase to another phase. I hope many of you are chemical engineers. If not, I apologize for not going into details on these. Uh, but the governing principles for determining how these equipment perform are known. These are the Newton's law of motion for velocity pressure relationships, but we cannot solve them at all scales. And that is where the challenge is. That's where the computers can come and help us solve in detail and get away with some of the simplifying assumptions that we make about Murphy tray and a perfect ideal tray, et cetera. And this is the internals to show how complicated the fluid mechanics is inside a distillation column. This is taken from a, a fractionation research incorporated in the US. What you see here is as the vapor rate upwards is going up from left to right, you see the vapor rate is very low. The liquid from the top tray is dripping. This is called the weeping regime. On the right hand side, the vapor flow is so large that it entrains the liquid into droplets and carries it to the tray above and mixes it. So the left and right end up mixing it. What we want is the ideal one in, in between where there is vigorous mixing between the vapor and liquid and there is a disengagement zone to so achieve perfect separation. Obviously it's a very complicated process that is happening inside the equipment. This is true of all chemical equipment. So they are heterogeneous in nature. They are multi-phase vapor liquid or solid liquid or liquid liquid. And it takes 10 to 20 years to develop a new device. And scale up is the challenge. And the new paradigm is why do we need to scale up? Why can't we scale out? Meaning why can't we make miniature equipment but modularize them? Because that gives us a lot of advantage for rapid innovation cycle. And I will talk about this a little later. So these are the types of typical types of equipment that they use, a bubble column, a fluidized bed reactor, an uh, agitated tank reactor, all of them have in common multi-phase mixtures. And they're used for different chemical reactors, et cetera. And the way that we design this is we do some experiments on the lab scale and measure some quantities, put them in dimensionless forms. Again, for non-chemical engineers, I apologize. Uh, chemical engineers are very familiar with this process. And then we say this dimensionless correlation should be applicable for all scales, as long as we retain the scale similarity uh, in terms of dynamic geometric uh, similarity, et cetera. But it fails. It fails for the following reason. If I do some experiments on the lab scale, and these are bubbles or catalyst particles that you see in the dark, I measure the heat transfer coefficient or pressure drop or mass transfer coefficient, when I build into a pilot scale and to a uh, plant scale, the circulation patterns become completely different. The particles are still the same. The distributor design becomes different. The circulation pattern becomes different. And so the, uh, the empirical correlation that we developed here often fails. And that's why we need to do through pilot scale to two or three scales. And that's a reason for enormous amount of time it takes to develop a new technology. If you're developing a new slurry bubble column reactor or a loop reactor, you need to spend 10 to 20 years testing on all scales before you can license the technology. And licensing the technology is a big business because of that. And what we need to do is to go from the molecular scale to the equipment scale as we scale up. The question is, can it be done? And I'm reasonably optimistic about this, and I will share you the re my reasons for that. This is an experiment that we did at uh, Louisiana, where we are trying to mix a dye with a liquid by injecting energy from an oscillating piston. It's the most inefficient way of doing it. But in the same film, you will see what are the alternatives. Uh, it will switch to the next stage of mixing, which is beat the hell out of it by putting a stirrer and input energy, uh, kinetic energy and see whether, it, or you can use the fractal distributor. Here, what's happening is a blue 
liquid is coming through one set of channels, the red liquid is coming through a different set of channels, and they are mixed at the very last scale for molecular diffusion to finish the mixing process. These are called fractal distributors and innovation in, in the design. That, but that is not an innovation because this nature does it all the time. On the right-hand side, you see the lung. What happens in the lung is a fractal distributor and air goes through that from one side to the alveoli. And on the other side, the blood comes, brings with it the spent carbon dioxide. And there's a membrane that exchanges. This is a, a chemical engineer should be able to understand and describe every one of these processes. It is the most fascinating chemical separation process where simultaneously you are exchanging carbon dioxide and uh, oxygen. And uh, we can learn from something like this and build it into our chemical plant in the future. And so the future plant will not be like the ones that you see on the top, but it will be like the ones that you see on the bottom right, which are modular and compact. And uh, so if one part fails, you can replace it with the latest version of the same part. Innovation becomes much more rapid. Why is innovation so rapid with computers? Because they have been modularized. Uh, a memory device is separate from uh, a CPU, uh, separate from uh, a, a keyboard or a mouse, and innovations can take place in each one of them, but they are able to operate, interoperate, interoperability is an important concept. So we need to bring that to chemical industry so that we can do plug and play, and then innovation can occur rapidly. So this is the big challenge that chemical engineers have to address uh, in terms of sustainability. It couples the water resource utilization, the energy resource utilization, and the food, right? So essentially what we are doing at present is consuming all the hydrocarbons that were stored for millions of years uh, in the reservoir and burning them at a high rate to meet our current energy demand. And that produces CO2 at a very high rate to sustain us. And this CO2 is released to the uh, atmosphere, but nature has a mechanism to fix the CO2 through photosynthesis back to hydrocarbons. As chemical engineers, we understand the rate controlling process and we have made that, uh, disturb that process. This is a very fast process right now. The fixing process is a very slow process. And so we are not in a sustainable situation. What we need to do is learn to fix CO2 back into hydrocarbons other than the photosynthetic route. So there are a lot of electrochemical, photochemical conversion technologies being researched uh, around the world. And uh, th that is where chemical engineers can contribute in the most innovative way uh, to accelerate the fixing of CO2. Of course, we can collect the CO2 and sequester it, but that doesn't solve the problem in the long run. It, it doesn't give us the sustainability. For sustainability, this forward path of burning CO2 should match the reverse path of fixing the CO2. This is a very complicated slide. Uh, the, all the equations and the framework that I'm talking about are buried in here. So I just want to spend a minute to tell you how we go from the molecular scale to the plant scale through a series of modeling approximations to develop the right model. Aspen Heiss's model for plant scale lives at the very top of the chain. And molecular dynamic simulation, density functional theory live at the bottom of it to understand the molecular interaction. But we also need to understand the fluid-fluid interaction, the heat transfer, the mass transfer, et cetera. So at this level, we can develop the right set of models. We can then drive an innovation cycle by looking at new designs. So I'm going to talk about mesoscale modeling, how it is used to innovate existing plants, a retrofit of a polyethylene loop reactor, and new designs were entirely done in the computer before we launch it in the field, the so-called the fractal distributors inspired by the lung, for example, or the arteries. And how do we uh, collapse the scattered data using machine learning, for example? And what is the reason for the scatter? So there are lots of uh, ideas here, and I'm not going to go into detail. We just need to understand all models are wrong. Some models are useful. A very famous quotation from George Box, a statistician, and this is the framework that we use in what I call EPIC at LSU. EPIC stands for Enabling Process Innovation Through Computation. How do we use computer models to innovate uh, chemical process design? 
So this is done by understanding the fundamentals of multi-phase, multi-scale, multi-physics processes, developing models, the simulators, the measurement technologies, and the manufacturing technologies. There are a lot of advances there in terms of 3D printing, additive manufacturing, et cetera, again, enabled by computers. And using that, we have to innovate our separation, mixing, and reaction processes. As I said, these are the core principles for chemical engineering and even in biology and use that to develop next generation of plants for sustainable, environmentally friendly, modular process designs. We need to come up with new designs. And then we can deploy that among all natural resources, whether it is alternate energy source, agri-based feedstock, water, even uh, reclaiming the water, uh, purifying the water, et cetera, to meet our demand, engineered products on the other side, agrochemicals, pharmaceuticals, advanced materials, et cetera. That's a framework to take it from a large plant to a modular plant to manage this mixing separation reaction and be inspired by nature and learn as many lessons as we can about the design process itself. At the design stage, we throw away a lot of degrees of freedom that we have by making arbitrary decisions. Why should every reactor be a cylindrical vessel? Why should an impeller be of a certain type? Why can't you imagine thousand impellers inside a reactor to achieve a homogeneous condition. So thinking out of the box, which was one of the top topics I saw in the ABN network. So let me just uh, rapidly go through two examples and conclude that uh, talk. First one was a problem that, that we were approached from a company. They were having a problem in a loop reactor for uh, producing polyethylene. So they came and showed us this figure. This was the figure of the pressure fluctuations in the slurry pipeline over a period of time, fairly large fluctuations. And this is a closed loop reactor. And essentially what they do is they inject a, uh, a catalyst and uh, a monomer, uh, ethylene or propylene, and it polymerizes and produces the polyethylene poly, uh, uh, propylene pellets. And uh, they then become a slurry and the slurry forms a slug and the slug hits the pump. It's an internal pump inside the loop. And so it causes the pressure fluctuation, causing the Recording pump. in progress. And this is and an this image of what you see here as a yellow, as a slurry, a slug, high concentration of particles. And here is the pump at the bottom. And I'm going to move through a series of slides and you will see the slug move up. As the slug moves up, the pump has to do work because it's pumping up a heavy material, but, and you see the pressure drop being high, power consumption being high. As it goes to the other side, the pressure drop goes down, the pump comes, power consumption goes down because it is descending in part by its own weight by gravity, right? So the pump, when it passes through this, it destroys the pump. It, I mean, it erodes the pump. And so they asked us, can we understand the reason for this and do away, uh, come up with a solution for this? So this is what we call a retrofit. So we took all the properties from there and we initially did a simulation with thousands of particles and try to understand what happens to the particles as we go around the bend, because we know that there is a centrifugal force. And we did the simulation, we found that the, all the particles are lined up to one side as it goes through, because they are heavier particles. And then we said, okay, this is the, the left-hand side is the actual uh, reactor. There are eight uh, pipes in a, in a loop form with an internal pump there. So we said we are going to look at as it comes out of a bend, what is the solid concentration? So the red means there are a lot of solids there. The blue means there is no solid there. And the question is, how do we remix it by the time it gets back to the next bend? Because the bend is in their original design and it's going to form this uh, uh, slugs as it comes out of the bend. So the way that we did that is put a bent vein to give it a circulation. And you will see an animation here. Uh, and this is the kind of vein that you put in. And what you will see is that the veins give it a swirl and mixes them up as the slurry goes up or down after a bend. And we put six veins and we found that the centrifugal force created by the veins was too large. So you still have segregation at the outer side, but the inner side, there is pure liquid. So you said, okay, let's reduce the number of veins. These are all done in simulation, using simulations, right? To do this in an experiment in a real plant will be very, very expensive. And we see that we could achieve a better homogenization. And the last one, we just used two small veins. 
and we had a measure of the concentration variation from the mean concentration and that gives the best mixing it's almost homogeneous in color that's the least energy consuming uh, device as well so we gave that as an option and design change for them uh, to fit in so this is what is possible with computer simulation using multi-phase uh, simulators and this was before this is after if you put those uh, retrofits the pressure fluctuations will be like this which means they can increase their productivity by five percent and increase their profit by millions of dollars and it costs them only four hundred five hundred thousand dollars to conduct the study over a three-year period through a phd student this is again illustrating university industry collaboration the last example that i'm going to talk about is the fractal distributor Fractals are these nature's uh, creation that you see in a broccoli or mathematical object that was introduced by Mandelbrot, which are essentially scale invariant. That is, as you zoom in, you find the same structure repeating itself on all scales. And you can build them as mathematical objects. They are self-similar. And you, nature uses this in brilliant ways, whether it is a lung or a broccoli uh, or a tree you will find similar scale uh, invariant structures. These are all some of the examples of scale invariant structures on a large range of scales. And this is our inspiration. But what is our problem? This is the current distributor that is used in packed distillation column, absorption column, et cetera. It's a Coke glitch distributor where the liquid goes in through a manifold, distributes itself through these branches and there are dripping points and they have empirical rules uh, how many dripping points you should have per square feet, et cetera. And what we are saying is we should replace this with the fractal distributor. Why? Because you will see that the flow rate from each one of these distributors is not constant. Why? Because the pressure drop from the entrance to this internal one is much smaller. So this will eject at a higher velocity than to the outer one because there is additional pressure drop here. And so this will start to drip uh, at a lower rate than the inner one. In the fractal distributor, even though some of them are near to the feet than the others, if you track the distance, the distance is exactly the same from the inlet to every one of those drip points. From here, for example, you're going through this, branching off, going through that, branching off, going through that, to reach the farthest one. But to reach the nearest one also, you have to go through exactly the same distance. Okay, Every time you branch into two. And so this was our inspiration. And uh, we, uh, it is being used in some industries already, uh, but we are going to build something for an ion exchange device, not for the packed columns, because the, the industry this time that supported us is Amalgamation Research Incorporated, a, a company that produces sugar from beetroots. And they have uh, these uh, chromatographic separation devices. So the design is uh, inspired by a filter press kind of a design. And so what we have is one inlet splitting into four. And these four are matched as a four inlets on the other side. Each is splitting into further more four. So one is split into 16, into 64, et cetera. Every plate that you add can further divide this into double the number of inlets. So we can achieve a homogeneous distribution for this particular design. This was done entirely in silico. Even before we built anything, we optimized the design. So this is our PhD student did that. You'll see some animation from uh, uh, solid uh, works uh, to illustrate how this was conceived and uh, built in the solid works and then sent out for fabrication. Now advances in uh, laser lithography, laser uh, uh, cutting, uh, 3D printing, et cetera, makes these designs possible. If you can conceive it, you can make it. He also did some experiments to look at what is the residence time distribution through this ion exchange when you have a fractal distributor of various number of plates, one to four or one to 16 or one to 256, et cetera. So experimentally demonstrated, as you increase the number of outlets, the residence time distribution gets sharper. Why is that important? We want to give every molecule the same experience in whether it is reacting or separating or mixing. That means the residence time ideally should be a spike so that all molecules stay the same amount of time in an equipment. And we can achieve that through this kind of a distributor, at least at the inlet stage. And this is a simulation in a CFD of how the splitting process occurs. So you see that uh, he had to add some additional cones at the end 
to make sure that the front goes as flat as possible when it enters the chromatographic separation column. That's a perfect design. And uh, of course, there are lots of steps in achieving this design. And uh, I, so he looked at the slight variations in the flow rates, uh, about 6% variation, and he asked the question, why? And he found that this kind of a design causes a vortex, a vortex to develop. And that means at the next branch point, they are not splitting equally because of what happened and asymmetry in this. And he said, okay, what would happen if I make this channel narrow? Because at the design stage, we make these decisions arbitrarily. Now with the computer, we can explore. We can explore the consequence of having a channel with a broad width versus a narrow width. Okay, so he systematically did hundreds of simulations to plot this response curve. And he said, avoid this range of aspect ratio and velocity, because that will give you a high coefficient of uh, variation. Design your system in this region. And so we could optimize the des uh, design to uh, achieve uniformity. So you can see the effect of it. So in this case, it splits equally, but in this case, when you have a broad one, more goes to the right-hand side than to the left-hand side. This is all what we call digital twins, a, a, a digital equivalent of a physical device. But before we build a physical device, we explore and uh, do these design changes. So we have extended this to other types of fractal distributors for from a square to a circular column. And this is used in a bubble column that you see on the right hand side. So this is uh, a ranking of all the possible models. Maybe I shouldn't go into this detail because I'm almost one hour into my talk. Uh, I'll so just make some concluding remarks so that we can have some time for discussion. Uh, the, the, the distribution of phases in the chemical reactors is hardly homogeneous. And we need to deal with that. And there are scales of appropriate scales for modeling that will allow us to capture this in a rigorous fashion and come up with design innovations, either as a retrofit or for future modular designs. And with this, we hope that we can cut down the process technology development for the future from 20 years to two years and accelerate the innovation cycle by modularizing and making it interoperable so that you can throw one piece of a modular equipment and replace it with a more modern version of it. And that should give us the innovations. Uh, <clears throat> I worked on a number of people and I want to thank all these uh, colleagues and uh, graduate students. And this is a slide probably I should leave you with because it is an optimistic sense and I uh, kind of highlights where India should focus on. This is a slide I came across uh, about three or four years ago that came in, uh, I think Economist or some, yeah, the Economist. It shows the GDP over the last 2000 years in the world. And 2000 years ago, if you see the two countries that dominated the GDP in the world are China and India. In fact, India has a larger portion 2000 years ago than even China, right? This was the case till about 1700s. And then the guns came and the uh, Western expansionism came and India and China were conquered and ruled and plundered and so, their GDP went down quite a bit, while that of America and Europe increased. But in the last 40 years, China has come really rolling, uh, roaring back. India is also expanding, and I'm seeing what I'm seeing in Mumbai is phenomenal. And uh, so there are opportunities for India to continue this innovation cycle in every sector. Right now, India is seen in the outside world as a software giant and as a service provider of the software, even there, not a developer of the next generation of computational tools in both hardware and software. That's something that should change. And a lot of uh, multinationals have come and set up their R&D facilities here because labor is cheap, not because innovation is at a high rate. But one of the talks that I listened to from the AABN network about uh, number of unicorns in India being 40 or something in the last year, it is pointing to in the right direction. Okay, so I think that's a good sign. And I think India is on a growth path. To, I consider these as our natural states over the last 1700 years from 2000 years ago to six, year 1600. And we will find our natural position in the world. Uh, but we do need to promote industry academia collaboration. Many of you that have industrial connections, I hope you participate in engaging with IITs and IISCs and TIFRs. There is enormous amount of uh, inter intelligence and brain power 
in these places and fund them to support their PhD students and let them explore innovative ideas, tell them your problems, but don't control them precisely. Then I think there is enormous opportunity for accelerating the innovation. In the US, there are some things called the engineering research centers funded by the National Science Foundation. So my message to the DST and SERB in India would be think about bringing such centers, bring four or five institutions centered around maybe one IIT and five or six engineering colleges in each region, tie them to the industry and fund them so that they can take technological development across the so-called valley of death from technology readiness level three to seven. And this is an early idea and to take it to the market, there is an enormous amount of resource that is needed and nobody is willing to invest in them. Uh, industry will take and run away with an idea that is at a technology readiness level of seven because they can realize profit very quickly. But I think we need to address this gap that exists in India. And I think this, you guys are doing a fantastic job in entrepreneurship training to students. I hope these uh, videos are used in classrooms and engineering colleges across the state. And uh, also provide incentives to faculty for generating patents and stuff like that. So with that, I will conclude and I will be happy to answer any questions. I apologize for going a little bit over my time. No, no not at all, not at all. Were you able to hear me? I just... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nanda Kumar. Now, can we open the floor to the floor for questions? Uh, Participants, you may please unmute and ask your questions, uh, please. I would like to ask a question a bit. Uh, you, very, uh, you were mentioning about the book by Ray Kurzweil. And uh, he, in collaboration with uh, uh, Peter Diamand, is, uh, has set up a book called Abundance, which he says uh, uh, solar energy uh, will become abundant and uh, will drive. And uh, now Reliance also is investing so much in uh, green hydrogen. Um, how do you foresee uh, uh, electrochemical, uh, because the, the limitation on electrochemical uh, reactors was uh, scaling up uh, can only be in two dimension as against conventional reaction reactors where it is three dimension. But with plenty of electricity coming, electrochemical reactors could come back. Um, and uh, what is your take? How, how, I mean, is adequate research being done? Uh, in India, there's only one CECRI, um, Karekudi, focusing on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, academics still teach only three-dimensional reactors most right. of the places. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm just curious how, how it is how the, it is changing in the U.S. and other parts thank, of the world. Yeah, uh, th th thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you for bringing to my attention the book by Abundance. I haven't read that book. I will certainly seek it out. Uh, I do uh, feel, like many others, that uh, solar energy is the sustaining force on Earth. Um, we talk of, uh, pet, uh, I mean, petroleum, but this is again, solar energy stored over millions of years through the photosynthetic process. And it's a vegetation that's converted into this. So uh, if you think about uh, any form of energy other than nuclear, nuclear, what I call is a miniature sun, <laughs> right? And what solar energy is, essentially through nuclear processes, energy released through the nuclear processes. And uh, so there is of course geothermal, uh, but uh, solar energy is going to be in abundance. It has always been in abundance. The question is, can we capture them with increasing efficiency? And uh, a lot of the research for this was done uh, in the US to enable uh, role manufacturing of the solar, solar cells. And China has brought down the cost of manufacturing and solar cells are now uh, becoming uh, very attractive and very cheap. So uh, electrochemical processes then should exploit that availability of uh, direct conversion of solar energy to, uh, through photovoltaics to electricity or through thermal. That's also another route that is possible. And there will be, integration of, I, I suspect, uh, 
designs that use both spectrums to capture both the thermal energy and uh, uh, photovoltaics uh, and the other electrochemical processes uh, that kind of mimic photosynthesis uh, to directly convert CO2 um, to fuels. But in the last week's lecture, I think uh, the Reliance uh, person talked about refineries repositioning themselves into chemicals because the dependence on by mobility sector, uh, automobiles, for example, on gasoline will go to batteries, for example, and that will help in terms of CO2. It will take some time for it to have an impact, I think, but that will happen. And so chemicals is probably the root of, for the, but the demand, I'm not sure whether it will be at the same scale for crude to in a, in a petroleum tank because we don't need chemicals in large quantities as we need fuel as we consume and burn the fuels. Uh, so there is a great opportunity for innovations in that space. And your point about why should every reactor be a three-dimensional reactor, a conventional reactor, that's a play. If you ask design questions at that stage and think out of the box, you can come up with all kinds of other designs. And because manufacturing can be automated, so uh, numbering up is a way to scale up is not out of the question. It was extremely expensive at one time, but computers are making things easier and cheaper through robotics, through automation in every sector of manufacturing. And so we should train our students to think in terms of these uh, totally innovative approaches. I'm not sure how your network can impact uh, curriculum or going into schools and or broadcasting these lectures to the students to show them the possibility of what innovation can do. And the brain power is there. These are all brilliant. We came from these schools. We are all doing well. And I'm sure the next generation will do even better than us. And so it's just the possibility should be opened up for them and things will happen. I, I agree completely with you on that. We should not be constraining ourselves to the traditional design scenarios. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Participants, you may please unmute and ask your questions. So, may yeah, I myself, uh, Anindita Moitra, I am from Delhi and public sector. Uh, it's very interesting uh, uh, presentation. My compliments to you on you. bringing different aspects of how can uh, innovation work and uh, already it is in uh, slowly it is coming into reality and also implemented many places uh, one question just I wanted to it's, it's always I pondered on that how to uh, like those who are in the research part they are very much enthusiastic they are finding also the problems when they want to come to the industry, the industries have the baggage that oh, we will take time. So the converting the innovation from lab to actual commercials is taking a lot of time, what I see. So yeah. that's what I wanted you to reflect as you have experience on this, what outside India things are happening and how, if you can uh, Yeah, um, not only outside, but even in India, I, I collaborate closely with Professor Joshi and the uh, Institute of Chemical Technology in Mumbai has been uh, working with chemical industry and supporting the chemical industry growth in Mumbai in a very, very uh, effective manner, I think. Uh, but the, the thing we need to recognize is uh, in a mature industry that is already operating plants, um, they are reluctant to share for business reasons what their problems are. So there has to be a trust that is developing between a, a, a company and uh, a researcher in academia. In my own experience, I will see that trust develops largely through our own students that go into industry uh, and they're working there and they face a challenge and they say, okay, maybe this person can solve this problem for me. And they approach us. And we, of course, we need to uh, sign contracts, uh, respecting intellectual property, confidentiality, et cetera. 
because it's their business. And so academia probably is not used to those kinds of things in general in India. ICT is a good example. I don't know how they can transfer that uh, expertise they have to other uh, parts of the region, but that is one problem that we need to recognize. When industry wants to come to you, you need to respect their uh, intellectual property and uh, uh, work with them on their problems. That's one aspect because they are coming to you with a specific problem and they need an answer to that. The second thing that should happen to collaborate, uh, to, uh, to build on industry university collaboration is what I talked about as ERCs in the US, where the government, in this case, the Department of Science and Technology, Science and Engineering Research Board, I'm thankful to them. They are the ones that supported my visit through Vajra program here. They should initiate centers of excellence focused on specific sectors. They could have one on solar energy, they could have one on pharma, et cetera, where technologies that are at early stages of discovery in, in an academic environment are taken across the valley of debt. So technology development is a prime uh, focus of such centers. And the way that they have done it in the US is five universities will be funded. It'll be a $20 million grant over five years, 4 million per year. At least five universities must be involved, at least two or three industries must be involved to guide them. Here, you're not solving current problems faced by industry. You are solving potentially a technology development, taking idea from the lab, uh, to industry across that. So there are innovative ideas. A chemist might discover a new chemical or a material that can have potential application. So that person may want to explore that. So this center can allow so that kind of exploration and innovation uh, that is uh, needed. And uh, to industry, I would say when a faculty expresses an interest, encourage them. Okay, encourage them and support them. The way that you can support them is, I don't want to tell you any of my secrets, but if you work in improving the bubble column performance or a fluidized bit reactor performance, I will support a two student PhD students. So work on that. And that way, train students back in that you can recruit. Normally these PhD students could be directly uh, recruited by you into your company. That's another model of interaction where industry can be playing a supportive role. The two examples that I gave, uh, one was developing the fractal distributor. The company just gave us some funding and said, go and do see what you can do. And the second example with the polyethylene reactor, the company came to us with a very specific problem. And uh, we signed a lot of uh, legal document with them uh, to undertake this work. And then we published it, of course, later on. So the ideas are in the public domain. Uh, but th their IP is protected uh, for the funding that they gave us to come up with a solution. I, I hope I'm giving you some ways of thinking about it. I'm not sure that I'm answering your specific no, question. No, definitely, definitely. A lot of insights. I hope these things come into real existence here and we move fast. Thank you so much. Yeah, the discussion should uh, go beyond Sunday meetings like this and it will happen. Here, we are just sowing the seed here. Uh, may I ask, sir? Uh, yeah, uh, please, please, sir. Sanjay, please go on, Sanjay. Yeah, sir, thank you, sir, for an excellent and informative uh, presentation, uh, uh, especially your last slide, uh, which mentions uh, of the next generation computational tools. And, uh, sir, you mentioned about that human body is a perfect uh, chemical machine, which means like it is sustainable, modular, I mean, in the sense that they are independent uh, systems, yet they beautifully blend in, I mean, blending with each other, uh, I mean, each other, and they uh, save energy as well. Now, yes. uh, when we are talking about computational tools, even if we make coarse models of human parts, I mean, human bodies, I mean, organs and other parts, mm -hmm. how they function. So even if we make coarser models, not, I mean, we cannot never make mm -hmm. perfect, but even mm -hmm. these coarser model may find various applications, uh, which we may have not thought of in chemical engineering uh, processes. So is it a, I mean, a right direction uh, in terms of chemical engineering, take, I mean, leveraging multidisciplinary benefits? I mean, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I strongly believe in that. And I encourage my students uh, 
to go into that area. And then a couple of our undergraduate students uh, at LSU have gone into medicine because of that. Um, the way that I learned this insight was listening to a seminar uh, from a, a PhD student at Alberta who went to become a faculty member in the University of British Columbia. And uh, he was doing work on biomedical research. Basically, he's a process control guy in chemical engineering, but he worked on administering the drug for uh, some heart related uh, illness. Um, so he was looking at drug delivery uh, technologies, and including process control algorithms, monitoring and uh, controlling. But he found that as an engineer, you cannot really prescribe any of these things because you need to have uh, a medical degree. So he took leave and went and did a medicine degree and then came back. I think he's the director of the biomedical engineering program right now, but a chemical engineer by training. And that's when I realized, and we asked him, he came to Alberta to give a seminar and we asked him, why did you feel compelled to do that? And his response was very illuminating. He said, when you see, for example, a discoloration in the skin and you go to a doctor, the doctor knows what medicine treats it. And so he'll give you the medication. But if you ask him, why did it form in the first place? He will have no clue because medicine that as practiced right now is highly correlated. Okay, we do clinical trials, we check the data because of the variability in the living systems and uh, mechanistic understanding is lacking. And chemical engineers approached all their problems from a mechanistic understanding, right? So we can bring that mechanistic understanding to bioprocesses. And so building models is one of the outcomes of mechanistic understanding, whether it's a reaction model, whether it's a uh, equilibrium model, whether it's a fluid mechanics model, uh, it brings us understanding and it brings us uh, deployability across many scales. And so I think uh, you are right on in terms of uh, building uh, simple models. And there are a lot of books coming out. Uh, biomedical engineering is becoming a big field. And uh, so uh, chemical engineers are, I think, making an impact there. Uh, they are renaming themselves as biomolecular and uh, biological engineering. So it essentially points to the fact that reaction, equilibria, transport have applications, not only in the plants that we build, but in the plants that we observe in nature and the living things that we observe in nature. So uh, that's the way it will evolve, I think, one, one aspect of it through interdisciplinary research. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just wanted, uh, based on what you said now, sir, I was just yeah. going through your slide in which uh, US chemical industry breakdown where you showed that basic specialty agriculture, pharma and consumer, if you see the products, they are actually uh, related uh, to nature in, in some way. Uh, right, even, right. The, even the chemical engineering products. So which means the processes which deliver these products could also mimic nature, maybe human body, animal, plant or anything. I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You see all of them. I mean, uh, if you yeah. say plastic resins, dyes, pigments, yeah. Yeah. or yeah. even adhesives, you know, I mean, in a, in, in a very uh, uh, the broader scope of that. I'm Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So this is a very, uh, sir, uh, once again, sir, thank you, sir. And uh, yeah, thank you. thanks for a wonderful lecture, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please go on, please go on. Question, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm also a PhD student sir. in the I have a, a question regarding like which you mentioned in the starting my it's just my time missed it. So uh, you said the relation between the solar energy and the nuclear energy. So mm -hmm. I just have wonder like the solar energy is a renewable resources, whereas the nuclear is a non renewable. So I mean, how did you link the both of it? So Okay, I was just a, using uh, this slide. And um, the nuclear energy, you, uh, you see the definition of what a renewable energy, uh, I guess uh, you can discuss that. But what I was meaning is energy released through nuclear reaction, right? So the nuclear plants on earth, I call them as miniature suns because the energy release is coming from nuclear reactions in a reactor. Sun, produces energy by the same mechanism, all stars. 
are thermonuclear reactors. And so they just build uh, new atoms uh, from uh, the fusion process, right? And so the energy source in that sense is coming from uh, the nuclear processes. I distinguish that from energy sources coming from chemically stored energy. When you burn fuel, it's uh, energy that is uh, stored in a chemical and reconstitute your chemical and release some energy from that. And that's exactly what happens in the human body also when we consume food the glucose is the, and everything is converted finally into glucose, which is absorbed at the muscle level and muscle is able to do work, right? We need the energy from there. And um, so th that, that is what I meant, uh, but re renewable in, in the sense that we commonly use it is, it's not one use, right? If you dig up the oil and use it, it's gone. Right. Uh, whereas a renewable one would be, it will come after year after year. The monsoon comes year after year and it gives us the water and that fills the reservoir. And we have hydro uh, uh, hydro dams. Uh, right. So electricity produced from uh, those can be thought of as renewable. Similarly, with windmills, we call them as renewable energy because the wind is. It, but if you ask the question, where does the rain come from? who does the work to lift the water from the ocean into the cloud and let it drop? Sun, sun's energy, right? If you ask about where is the wind energy coming from? All the atmospheric motions are created by heating and cooling cycles. Um, and so again, that energy is coming from the sun, right? So all these renewable energies can be thought of as being driven by the energy that we receive from the sun. The only uh, exception to this rule, I think, is the geothermal, which is as you dig deeper and deeper into the earth, there is a hot mantle. Those energies are formed at the time of formation of uh, earth as a planet, right? But other than that, I'm interpreting it in a generic way that what you call as renewable energy is also derived from sun's energy through some intermediate steps. And in that sense, I would also put fossil fuels as derived from sun's energy, except that it was done millions of years ago. Am I making sense? You can challenge yeah. me. You can challenge me. Uh, I, I got it. Like, I just yeah. have a question, like, how did you um, right. like, related it? But yeah, it makes sense now. Thank you. Uh, sir, can I ask a question, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please, please go on. Please go on. Uh, sir, I represent Indian Oil Corporation Limited. Uh, my question, since I am from energy company, so my question is that in recent years, we have seen a rapid development in the technological sectors, be it uh, Apple, be it Google, but the yeah. pace of development in technology is not that fast in energy sector. Is it the inherent nature of the technology which prohibits energy sector to develop rapid technology or the quantum of fund that is allocated and the volume of research that is carried out in these technological companies due to which they are uh, rapidly making new products. So my, my question is that, is there any analogy that we can derive from these technological companies for faster yes. development of products? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I guess I didn't really make it very distinctly clear, but the argument that I'm making is because the complexity of the process inside any equipment, whether it is a distillation column or a reactor, that the refineries and uh, petrochemical companies are engaged in, developing a new technology, by that I mean developing a new process equipment, takes 20 years or so because they need to go through pilot scale testing and development, et cetera. And uh, at the end, large scale is valued because of the economy of the scale. And so they end up building huge plants, billion dollar plants, and nobody is going to throw out one because a new model comes in, right? And so the replacement is not as fast because of the heavy capital investment that is needed for these chemical plants and energy plants. 
And the argument that I'm making is this is not going to fix problems that have, we have come up to now at the present stage, but in the future design, if we can think of modular designs and uh, not all large scale three-dimensional reactors, but other type of configurations for reactors that are modular, then we can introduce ac uh, accelerated pace of innovation. Why? Well, the two key things that we need um, is uh, simplify the problem, make it in small scale, but replicate to achieve your productivity goals. Like I need to produce a million tons or something. You achieve that by repeating smaller units in a large numbers to achieve the same uh, production goals. And it's not the, the argument that we, we don't use that currently is because it's very expensive to make each unit, but that is going to change with automation in fabrication technologies. Okay. And so I'm not talking about tomorrow, but I'm in the, the next 20 years, 50 years, we are going towards that where anything that you can see, you can make cheaply because it's only the robots that are going to assemble that, right? And uh, so we should be able to think to accelerate the innovation. Right now, we cannot replace the existing plants because they are expensive, they are capital intensive, we have invested a lot of money, so we are not going to be able to replace them. But the lessons that we can learn from the industries that you're talking about, the information communication technologies is make it modular, make it interoperable. Okay, so you take a more module and replace it with the newest version of the module, it should be able to work with the, all the others. So if I have an aging computer that has only uh, five, 12 megabytes of hard disk, I can throw the hard disk and replace it with a higher capacity, higher rating, and it'll still work fine, right? And that's the kind of modularity and interoperability that we need to achieve in the chemical, uh, energy, minerals, materials, uh, manufacturing space to accelerate the pace of innovation. Am I making sense? Uh, yes, sir, very much. Actually, okay. sir, in uh, what is happening in energy sector, in refining sector, few design companies, they are coming up with modular design, but that is uh, completely on the construction part, but not on the design part. Mm -hmm. That is for fabrication or uh, implementation. It, it helps during execution of the project. But on the design part, what you have said, I have not come across this kind of design till yet in the finance sector, but it's a really promising thing to look forward. Yeah, I Thanks. think we need to introduce these ideas in, in educational institutions now, then we will reap the benefits of this in 10, 15, 20 years or so, yeah. Uh, my name is Raju. I'm calling from yeah, Dubai. But, yeah, but we please go on. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's quite a uh, thought provoking uh, lecture, sir. Uh, extremely thankful Thank you. to you for uh, the uh, elaborate and quite simple. And uh, it's very, very thought provoking. My question is uh, see, actually, as you rightly pointed out, in our colleges you know, in, in India, the syllabus, if you see, what I learned some 30 years back, the same syllabus has been there right now by college commissions. Same most answered by Trey Ball and uh, uh, what you call unit operations by Maccabi theorem. And uh, competition skills are not being uh, really practiced at the, at the undergraduate level. Yeah. Do you think that it makes any sense for people like you who have been in a kind of uh, in the thick of the things that, uh, that is uh, Academia versus industry and all. Why don't we kind of advisory to our government on this lines, the kind of syllabus that needs to be incorporated rather than going with the same syllabus which we have uh, Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to uh, kind of speak out on behalf of any institution to any government if that would help. In the article that we wrote, we actually lay out uh, a four year sequence of a uh, computationally related course and how computational uh, education can be improved in the current chemical engineering curriculum. Uh, I can send you a copy of that article, uh, or if you have access, you can download it from the ACS uh, website. 
if you send me the email, I can send it to you, or I'll send it to Gopi. He can just yes, sir. I'll do that, sir. Anybody I'll do that. needs it. Uh, the the vision that we have laid out is in the first year engineering, all students take a computer programming course. And uh, my preference at the moment would be Python-based course because it introduces a lot of uh, complex uh, object-oriented uh, ideas in programming. And it's a very powerful and uh, open source de developed uh, programming environment, free to download, et cetera. Uh, the second year we followed this, we follow this by a numerical methods course is how do we solve engineering equations numerically on a computer. So we go into algorithms and stuff. That's the second year in engineering. In the third year engineering course, we have an option of three technical electives. One focused on what we call computational transport phenomena, one focused on computational biology, and one focused on computational chemistry. Computational chemistry will look at uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulation, density functional theory, to look at molecular interactions. What can it uh, tell us? Computational uh, biology will tell us bioinformatics, how do we decode DNA sequence, et cetera. And uh, there are a lot of opportunities for you chemi producing chemicals through biotechnology. For example, I'm a diabetic and I depend on something called a stevia, which is produced by a plant. It's a sugar substitute produced by a plant. But then there is a company in Europe called DSM. It's producing the same thing without a plant by injecting those DNA sequences into a bacteria and through a fermentation process. So the production uh, innovation in those space is phenomenal. So computational biology is going to be an important part. And then computational transport phenomena is what I do, which looks at mixing heat transfer, mass transfer, et cetera, to enable reaction and separation. So in the third year, they will do one of these three courses. And in the fourth year, they will have a project and the project will be by a team. The team may consist of one biologist, one, I mean, one that has taken a computation biology, one that has taken computation chemistry and one that has taken computation transport phenomena. They use their skills combined to solve some industrial problem using computers in design innovation. We have in most chemical engineering curriculum, a senior design project course. That's where you will introduce this project-based, computation-based course. That's my vision. It's quite arbitrary. People can disagree with that, and there will be a heated debate on this. But we need to do something to introduce this idea of importance of computers and chemical engineering education. Sir, I have got one more question, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please go on, sir. Uh, sir, uh, you had uh, given a summary of the developments in the chemical engineering in one slide. Uh, could uh -huh. you please uh, uh, show that again, sir? Because uh, that is related to the question for the next generation computation tools. Oh, you're talking about the last slide towards the end? Uh, no, no, the one I think you blow. You, yes, one. I think, yeah, this one, sir. Now, these, uh, yeah, this one, single phase. Now, uh, the computational more tools and models where do you actually fit in i mean in the sense that all of them are involved but in that co model complexity uh, for the future progress i mean how do you show that here i mean this is what is existing right this is my assessment the right hand column is my assessment of the risk in using those levels of models okay. uh, for designing equipment so if you are doing a static mixer, for example, of two species in a single phase, we can design that without any risk because we know single phase laminar flow, single phase turbulent flow models are very, very good error within two to 3% or so because we have understood them very well. But when you go into reacting flows, then the uncertainty goes up because the intrinsic kinetics, even the way that it is measured uh, if it comes from density functional theory, it is truly intrinsic. But if you're measuring it in a lab, you need to measure it where transport doesn't affect your reaction. So the un uncertainty in the kinetic models, which couple with the other models, turbulence models and uh, transport and heat transfer models, the risk goes up a little bit. But still for retrofitting and for uh, screening out a range of designs, they are still reliable. 
I would say that you can use them for reacting flows. When you go for multi-phase, still it is uh, the risk remains at medium or high, depending on what kind of systems, like liquid solid systems, fluidized beds, a gas fluidized bed, liquid fluidized bed, is reasonably reliable. But when you look at liquid liquid extraction or gas liquid bubble columns, then you need to include the bubble breakup and coalescence or droplet breakup and coalescence physics. This is done through population barrels models. The uncertainty goes up because of the uncertainties in that model. So that is what I was using to classify and rank the level of difficulty. If you have phase change, for example, crystallization, liquid to solid or evaporation, boiling, condensation, there are phenomena that are occurring at the molecular scale. Nucleation is a molecular scale phenomena. So we need a model for nucleation kinetics. And it's very, very un uncertainty is very, very high. But I, I have not refrained from using these because there are models still available for uh, nucleation kinetics and we can use that with bubbling flows, et cetera. Um, but uh, if we, by sustained use and testing of these models, our confidence in that goes up, but we need to have also carefully controlled experiments to measure and validate these models. And this is where an industrial consortium can give a set of funds to an expert group in one of the IITs and say, develop better population balance models, right? And that will benefit the entire sector, industry sector. So that's how to advance that field. And that was the motivation for um, putting these in some order. But most of the chemical industries in the US are building in the last 10 years, a strong CFD group. So they're seeing CFD as not only for post-mortem analysis. Like if there is an accident, they would say, oh, let's do CFD and see why it happened, right? Initially, that was the, the level of engagement, but now they are using it internally to troubleshoot their plants. Why is this plant not, uh, this equipment not producing as well as it was designed to be? The UCFD to get some insights, but it hasn't gone to the stage of designing the next generation of equipment. Sir, in this case, like the last one where the risk is very high, yeah. uh, can a counterpart in the nature, uh, I mean, mimic this some where the risks are low? I mean, uh, something like I'm just, I mean, making a wild guess like blood flow or something like that. I mean, I mean, it's a wild guess. I mean, uh, um, no, the, the nature itself is so complicated that we don't understand it fully. Okay. Right? Yeah. So if you don't understand it, we cannot build models for natural systems also. Right. Right. And uh, the, the complexity in the natural systems comes from, I mean, if you think about it, most of the plants blast pressure and temperature, very high pressure, very high temperature to get things assembled into molecules from one set of molecules to another set of molecules. Okay. Nature constructs these plants and these uh, uh, animals, etc., uh, differentiate the cells and construct new materials, uh, new chemicals at room temperature and room pressure. Certainly slow rate, but through precise control of signaling. The so signaling of biological molecules is extremely important. They use only the very weak uh, Van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonding, et cetera, to signal and to assemble. Like if you take uh, the COVID virus and the protein, the proteins gain their function by specific structure they uh, assemble. And the structure formation, the protein folding problem remained a difficult problem to solve computationally until AI came in. Google claims that they have solved the protein folding problem, that they can form these protein structures uh, in a computer very easily. And that's an enormous significant step, I think. So nature is extremely complicated because it does things with, with very, very weak signals between molecules to achieve precise condition. If you take how a human body develops from a single cell to form various uh, organs, the precision with which it assembles these molecules is uh, phenomenal, I think. So we don't fully understand that yet. So thank you, sir, for the very detailed uh, uh, in, I mean, explanation. I, I got a lot of ideas from your uh, reply as well, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Once thank you. So, thank you. Gopi, can I make uh, just uh, two observations? <coughs> yes, sir. Please, sir. <clears throat> hey, one is about uh, the outdated uh, syllabus. Mm -hmm. uh, the vice chancellor of 
Anna University has taken an initiative to revise the syllabus of all the engineering courses, including chemical engineering. Oh. And the team which is working on this is not only people from the uh, colleges, but also representatives of uh, chemical industries, especially mm -hmm. for uh, chemical engineering syllabus. Mm -hmm. So a lot of brainstorming is going on and uh, it is in the process of removing certain unwanted things and including things which is more of uh, the current technology linked and also industry oriented in the direction the team is already moving on. This is one. Right. Next thing is VC also has planned that final year students between yeah. seventh semester and eighth semester in the seventh semester, 50% of the students will go for implant training. They will get attached to some industry and the balance will be engaged in a project. And in the eighth semester, whoever went for the industry, they will come back and do the project. Who mm -hmm. was doing will go to the industry. It means the orientation in the industry is a must. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, development which is taking place. I just wanted to inform the audience, especially since there was a mention about uh, outdated syllabus. Yes, our syllabus is outdated and uh, it is being updated. The second thing is, just for information, of course, you and I know about that, but still for others who may not know, Chemical Industries Association, Indian Chemical Council and Manali Industries Association has uh, taken the initiative to form what is called as the ChemSkill Development Center. This is just uh, six months old. ChemSkill Development Center runs bridge program for final year chemical students covering subjects which are not taught in the college, but we feel are essential before somebody enters into an industry. Mm -hmm. So far, about five batches have been covered with more than about uh, 200 uh, students. And uh, interacting with uh, some of them who have got um, uh, employed in uh, different kind of industries, the feedback is very positive. They say that this bridge course really uh, placed them in a better place in terms of facing the interview because they knew more compared to others. And even while working with respect to their own peers, they find that they're in a better place because of the additional inputs given. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very nice uh, development to hear about. Thank you. Any questions? You may please unmute and ask your questions, please. Participants. I think, there are no, I think there are no further questions, sir. So thank you very much for that uh, very engaging session, uh, Andu, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We had a lot of takeaways from it. And, uh,